And we're back, Stripe Show Podcast, on a uh, Thursday. I'm your host, Travis Fulton. Thanks for making us part of your day. Hope you're having a uh, a good week. I know winter weather up there in most of the United States. You're looking out your window and you see snow and it's like 12 degrees. The wind's blowing and you're like, man, golf season is still a ways away. If it makes you feel any better. I'm here in Northeast Florida. It was 32 degrees here this morning. So it's uh, we're getting a little winter weather here. My guest is further south. He just told me that it was 84 degrees yesterday uh, where he was at in uh, in southern Florida. I've been working on this one for a while, folks. You're going to enjoy this. Uh, we're going to go deep into the short game with my guest, Mr. Uh, Jeffrey Pierce. How you doing, bud? I'm good, Travis. Thanks for having me on. So uh, I've been we've been uh, I've been trying to get a hold of you. Switched your phone number on me. I, I watched uh, I watched this really cool presentation you did up in uh, Savannah at uh, coaches camp that Andrew Rice puts on every year. And I was thinking the whole time, I was like, man, this would be perfect for my audience because not only do you know your stuff, but you're very articulate. You explain it very well. And I think reading lies around the green and then how that should dictate the type of shot um, you're going to hit, I think is going to be uh, brilliant here today. And I think our audience uh, is going to get a lot out of it. Before we get to that, though, I got to ask you, you've been doing this for a long time. You just told me you've been out there on tour for about 14 years. Yeah. How much has your, how much has your teaching evolved since you started? I mean, do you find yourself like right now when you go out and you teach and you work with Brooks Kepke and others, do do you ever just take a step back and say, man, my teaching is a lot different today than it was say five years ago, 10 years ago, et cetera. There's, there's no question. I should probably refund most of the people. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, I, I think that's in, in any industry, in any job, I think, you know, somebody that has been in there for, you know, a decade to two decades, you know, you, you gain a little bit of understanding and knowledge of, of what's going on a little bit more than you had. And you realize that you may be, you know, wrong is the wrong word sometimes, but you certainly went about it in an ineffective or mm-hmm. kind of floppy way. So, uh, there's definitely things that I've, I've 180 on that as I've learned and got to see, sort of the reality of what happens at high level golf versus sort of theory. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you definitely learn. Uh, and then the biggest thing is being around the coaches that have been out there for so long uh, with success. So you pick their brain, you get a little experience yourself. Technology has changed so much. We can measure like the guys that are on the cutting edge of instruction. Uh, if you're not willing to say I was wrong, yep. uh, you're, you're behind the curve because we've just got too much stuff now. Uh, between, you know, gears, 3D measuring, TrackMan changed the game, you know, 15, 16 years ago. You know, all the stuff we can do now, um, there's a lot of theory that you you could never really check. Mm-hmm. And in the last decade, technology has allowed us to measure and check those things. So, you know, I, you know you're always going to be wrong about something. You know, the best in the yeah. world is going to be wrong about something. So it's been fun actually watching that. Uh, like I said, the biggest thing is, uh, the fun part for working with really elite players is you get to take your your theories and the things that, that you've come up with and you've tested a little bit and uh, kind of hand that information to world-class players and and test it mm-hmm. and get feedback from guys. Like, yeah, we ne- I would never do that in play. Like, can yeah. do that? Or some of the stuff, it's like, oh, my gosh, like how simple is that and why have I not been doing it? So it's you kind of get to test your, your book of theories. And uh, I think that's where the guys that have – had access to good players for so long that they go about it. That's why they're a little sharper is that they've actually, their, their theories and stuff are a little more battle tested. Like they kind of know what works and what doesn't. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting with the short game and putting, and I know you do a lot of putting as well. And we're going to focus today, you know, primarily on the short game shots, but I think what you said there's important for a lot of the teachers that follow the podcast, young teachers, like you're going to evolve as you go. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's okay to be passionate about what you're teaching, but like that, that message and the way that you organize things is going to continue to evolve. Um, I know for me, it's the same way. I wish I could go back probably to the first five years when I got to Florida back in 2001 and even 10 years, maybe to some degree and, and refund some, some people on the way that I was going about, you know, whether to get shaft lean or whether to you know, get more out of their pivot, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, you're always learning and evolving and and especially in this industry and what has taken on some of the technology that you mentioned. But what I always tell amateurs is that you might not be able to do 
what you watch on TV to a large degree. For example, the way that these guys rotate, the way that these guys can clear and get out of the way. Like, you know, I'm 46. I can't open up like, you know, a player that we would see on tour, you know, sure. and like I'm, I'm in decent shape and I can, you know, I hit some balls and I, I can't get my, my body to, to rotate and open up, open up like that. And, and, and most amateurs can't. So it, it's hard to, you can use examples of, of certain players, maybe like a Victor Hovland and, and DJ and things like that. But the reality is, is like our body's just not going to move like that dynamically when we're hitting a golf ball. Now, when you come to short game and you get to putting, like, okay, that's kind of a different yeah, discussion. Yeah, there's no real barrier there. Yeah. It's, right. A hundred percent. I fought that. And I, and I do a little bit of uh, – not, not a ton anymore, but I, I do uh, – my place up in North Carolina this summer, uh, do some – do a lot of member golf. And a hundred percent right, right? You're talking about guys that, that are – they've got – they've got jobs. They're not professional athletes. Like even us, we were around golf a lot. We, we don't spend the time in the gym and then kind of, kind of like call it golf shape. You know, yeah. those guys, a lot of golf balls, it's just their motor pattern. Like we, if you're, if you're sitting in an office or doing something non-athletic 40 hours a week, you're not a professional athlete. You're not going to move like that. <laughs> uh, it's, yeah. a, it's a hard, it's a hard yeah, reality yeah. a lot of the time. But, yeah. uh, you know, it, it is what it is, but the closer we get to the hole, um, the separation from what's necessary physically to what's available uh, closes. I always, I always make the statement to people uh, when, you know, if we talk about putting for a second, you go, if I was going to go have a, a golf competition against whatever the best player in the world, whatever they call it, Rory, DJ, any, pick, you know, pick your best player in the world. Mm-hmm. So if you choose anything other than putting, you've lost before you hit the shot. But on the putting surface, because everyone can, everyone can hit it far enough, so speed's not a problem. There's no advantages to how high or low or shape or like the variables are gone. It, it's, it's doable by anybody. So mm-hmm. you got to chip, but as soon as you go into chipping, as soon as you go into pitching a full seven iron, a driving time, you're, you're, done. you're mm-hmm. done. So the farther you get away from the hole, the more that's asked of you physically to be successful. So it's one of the reasons I do enjoy short game so much is that for the, for a large part of it, I don't really tailor the conversation differently to an amateur golfer as I would a world-class golfer, because physically they're, they're capable to do everything they need to do. The coordination might not be quite yeah. with professional athletes, but they can do everything that they, that they need to do. Right. And they can get really more instant results, which a lot of people are looking for too. You Whereas know, like, hitting, to your point, like hitting, if I'm trying, if you're trying to teach an amateur golfer how to hit, you know, a driver farther or a five iron higher, Right. That takes some work. They're changing a motor pattern. If, if they're duffing chips in 10, 15 minutes, you can get yeah. them to hit nice, solid spinning chips. Yeah. And it's the immediate, the immediate improvement is possible there. So if you're an amateur golfer looking to get a little bit better, I mean, the short game and putting is low hanging fruit. If you're not already really good at that, like, go, go get better at that because you can get better fast. All right, let's get into it. So we're going to go through four different lies. And Jeffrey's going to talk about the lie. He's going to set it up. So for our audio, uh, people who are just listening, um, appreciate you being here. For those on video, on uh, YouTube, you'll be able to see some of this um, a little bit more uh, clearly. But we're going to articulate it um, extremely well and paint this picture. So I'm going to bring in what you call the uh, first lie. And there's, there's four lies. We got them labeled here, A, B, C, and D. And Jeffrey, I'll just kind of let you set the stage here of, you know, some of the variables that we're going to be looking at and then kind of transition that into the A lie or the first lie here that we have up on the screen. Gotcha. So, I mean, if, if we just take a quick, you know, quick thought on how to control our golf ball in the short game, um, there's a couple main variables, uh, obviously loft that we're going to have. So that a lot of time can be club choice, uh, even if it's the lob wedge, Kind of how we set up. So loft is going to be a part of it. Angle of attack is going to be a part of it. Uh, that's for the guys that are kind of track man guys. That's basically your your spin loft number uh, difference of uh, how steep I am versus how much loft I have. Um, that plays a part in friction and ball speeds. So if we in an A lie, we we're assuming we can get groove on ball, uh, no grass, no wall, no nothing between groove on ball. So basically, kind of fairway lie, fringe lie short rough lie where it's sitting on top to where there's nothing that's going to change the rules of friction and speed from pure spin loft and contact. 
Mm -hmm. um, the things that we start as we go through some of the rest of these lives, and we'll come back to the A-lock. Uh, when I start getting grass, when I start getting water, when I start getting sand between my ball and my club face, uh, that's essentially going to be a loss of friction. And so we're going to lose some spin, but there are some trade-offs to that. So as we lose spin, we usually gain trajectory. So the biggest thing when, when we're reading lies, and this is sort of the, the biggest thing we'll do uh, week to week on tour is like, if I'm hitting a seven iron out of a fairway, it's the same pretty much everywhere. I might change my yardage a little bit for elevation or temperature, but it's, it's the same mechanics. I don't really don't change anything. The biggest thing we're looking week to week is what type of grass we're we playing in. Does the ball kind of settle to the bottom around the green? Does it stay on top? Those are the variables that are hardest to uh, the word you predict. Uh, that's what we're trying to do. And if we can predict what's going to happen in that impact, you know, how much friction can I keep or lose intentionally? Uh, we can at least get a better idea and, and again, predict how hard I need to hit this to get this shot to at least be a functional shot. So when we look at a lie uh, for the people that can see that, you know, I'll just kind of read off of it. There's no media or grass uh, between the ball and the groove, full control of all of them. And like I said there, this is kind of like you'd be chipping or pitching from the fairway uh, short grass to where nothing's going to be in the way. And this is where we would sort of start a player. Like I need to be able to hit this shot uh, with a lot of control because there's nothing funky about it. It's literally, you know, what loft did I choose? How hard do I need to hit it? I'm going to make good contact. So as we're going through this and, and I introduce it to anybody, we're going to assume quality contact or at least control of strike. Yeah. Um, if we don't have that with a player, we've got to kind of work from the allies to go, are our mechanics saw enough or, or do we understand how we can just pitch and chip sort of on a, on a standard lie? That's, that's, that's baseline. If we've got a good strategy for that, we get to move on pretty quickly. So let's assume um, that we do, but in the a uh, without getting into specific mechanics, you know, we, we need control over spin loft or I need enough angle of attack to guarantee um, you know, contact and where the low point of that arc is. And I want enough loft to have a little bit of spin on some shots or, or, you know, go down and wedge if it's supposed to be a releasing shot. Mm -hmm. We're essentially, if we think about wedge play from the green side, we're either intentionally gaining spin or losing it and gaining trajectory or losing it. And then it just becomes a, how hard do I need to hit it with those variables? That, that would be our hope uh, to make it a really simple algebra problem. Yeah. So on, so on this particular lie, which is, is, is a pretty good lie, um, or very good, like it could be sitting in the fairway, it could be, like you said, sitting up a little bit in the rough. Um, you, you see a couple different techniques on tour, and I'll just kind of demonstrate here for a second. Like you see, I, I think about a Jason Day, um, where it's, it looks like the shaft and the lead arm kind of stay in line, very passive wrist hinge. Mm -hmm. um, it mm -hmm. looks, Jeffrey, pretty wide going back, um, maybe a little narrower coming through. You know, you see the left elbow kind of fold, left wrist definitely into a little extension. But there's not a lot of radial, not a lot of wrist hinge you see, you know, yep. in that particular player. Uh, I think Wills Altouris hits a lot of shots like that. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, other times uh, you'll see players, they'll, they'll, they'll maybe take on a little bit more radial. Yeah. Um, but the club head just gets maybe a little bit above the lead wrist. You know, there's not a, an excessive amount, let's say, um, green side. Where, where do you tend to gravitate for like an amateur player on just, you know, ensuring fairly solid contact, some friction, got some control over the ball, nothing crazy? Yeah. So when we're looking at wrist angles, kind of have a, um, a rule there and kind of describe this for the people at home that are, that are listening. Um, we won't find most of our really good wedge players that will get past neutral uh, when we kind of talk about ulnar and radial or down cocking or hinging up, whatever we're going to talk about. So yeah. when you're when we're talking lead wrists from a right-handed player, your left hand, when you're at a dress and you're holding the club, that left wrist will be slightly cocked down or an ulnar from neutral. Um, you know, it might be 8, 10, 12 degrees, depending on exactly how strong the grip is. You're talking right, right here. Yeah, that yeah. little that little angle right there. Yeah. So what we're looking at is we won't see that player break neutral very often. So they will go from ulnar to neutral, but they won't get into radial very often for sort of green side chips. So that wrist, the, the alignment of that hand and forearm will get back to in line. 
it won't hinge a ton. You'll, you won't see a ton of guys at green side, standard green side pitches and chips go past neutral. So they'll go from downcock to, you know, normal, everybody in grip is in a little bit of a downcock, a little bit of ulnar. As they're making their backstroke, they'll get to neutral for, for basic shots. As we start having to hit bunker shots or high shots, fancier shots you'll definitely see some more wrist hinge and they'll get into some radial mm-hmm. but for the standard and the and the amateur at home if you're struggling for contact i would i would calm that wrist down and definitely not get past neutral and then like those guys you know your jason day your steve stricker guys like that um, the torso rotating and moving properly and the pelvis as well without wrist hinge is probably the easiest way to get somebody struggling to kind of yeah. Okay. I can control some contact and hit some standard shots. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I think it's, um, that feeling of just pretty, pretty passive, you know, I mean, yeah. cause most, you know, from an amateur perspective, like they're going to get a little too handsy, you know, in this particular yep. shot, a lot of them might get it a little bit underneath or, you know, yep. those kinds of things. So now with that, the, the idea of the, of the, of the torso in kind of this top button, do you find, Jeffrey, as you in short game, that that neutral, that spine gets a little bit more, say, stacked and neutral at address, maybe even a little bit, you know, what feels left and open versus, you know, in the full swing, you'll see guys kind of set up in a little more right bend. Correct. You know, so they're getting a little bit more on top of it to help kind of control that uh, point of entry and low point. Yeah, so the, the biggest thing I'll see in 3D, and I think, and I think uh, Hamilton may, last week had Scott on. Yeah been a lot of time in his studio uh, up in Cartersville and it, you know the actual measurement on gears of what we'll see so it'll sort of measure center of rib cage center pelvis pelvis sorry excuse me and uh, spine tilt what we'll see out of our best wedge players is pretty darn neutral to dress or slightly for a right-handed golfer tilted left towards target maybe a degree or two but then in backstroke uh, and this is this is kind of one of the things I think is misunderstood a lot in backstroke, we will see our best wedgers uh, actually move towards target. So we mm-hmm. will see center of rib cage move towards target a little bit more than center of pelvis. So they're actually increasing yeah. that target and moving in front of it in backstroke. And, you know, if we want to reference the in vogue thing right now, like Joe Mayo is obviously on fire uh, on social media with yeah. the deep angle of attacks. Uh, he's sort of proven a point to the status quo that steep isn't dangerous. Um, it, it, and I, I've done a lot of business with Joe. Joe knows that no tour players out there are just ripping 15 degree angle attacks off on standard chip shots. Um, but we generally would see our best players from that position of slightly forward, slightly tilted, be more in the seven, eight, nine ballpark mm-hmm. uh, for the standard stuff. If they're hitting a, just a flat little neutral chip with some, with some spin, but we get that absolutely opposite of golf swing uh, where that spine's tilted a little bit more towards target. We move towards target. And then basically in downstroke, we sort of, we center that back out. So pelvis gets back under rib cage, yep. but pops us up and keeps us from just shoving it into the ground. Yeah. Uh, but for setup and, and basic movement. Yeah. That definitely a little more st- Most of the amateur golfers that I'll see that struggle are in like hitting position. Like you would say, like kind of tilt right. Yeah. in. we see in 3d, even good players, if it end a backstroke, they end up even remotely tilted away or pelvis in front of rib cage. It's a death move. Like it's mm-hmm. really, really hard to then control that that contact. Let's go to the next one here. So this is um, the B lie lie number two. So set the stage on that. Okay. So this is now we're not in um, perfect lie. We are. Uh, we're going to have some. This is this is maybe just in the rough, like the first cut of rough. Uh, you cannot guarantee that you're going to get a groove to touch that ball directly, right? So, again, the people um, listening will just kind of uh, read that off there. It's relatively predictable. Uh, almost all the options are available for, for types of shots. And back up real quick to the a lie. You can hit any shot you want off of that. Mm-hmm. Because you can control friction with your loft choices and speed choices, you can go high, you can go low, you can run it, you can spin it. Every shot's available if you know how to hit it. <clears throat> so, as we start introducing things between club face and ball, we start losing some of the options of shots. And that's the biggest thing to learn because if as a player, you're trying to hit a shot that's really not possible from the lie, 
you kind of shot yourself in the foot before you even before you uh, try to execute. So knowing what you can and can't do from lies is is huge uh, in predicting. Uh, so again, the B lie is pretty predictable. You're you're um, you're gonna have a little bit of grass between the ball and the club. Uh, it's not the ball is not sitting on the bottom of the ground. That's gonna be our next lie. So there's a little room under the ball. There's a little grass behind it. It's still a pretty comfortable lie for for most golfers. Um, the biggest things you got to realize here when we start introducing things between the ball and the club face is we're going to lose friction, which means we're going to lose spin. Mm -hmm. Um, that that you you can take that as a negative or you can take it generally where people are going to struggle with the shot is short sided. The amateur golfer is, but really you, you got to realize you're going to be way more successful trying to play that shot a little higher because without friction, the ball goes up. There's an inverse relationship there. So if I don't have spin, I can get trajectory. So unless this pin is a long pin, then it's super easy to just, you know, grab your sand wedge or gap wedge, hit a normal chip. It's not going to get spin, and it's going to release. Mm-hmm. Super easy to play a running shot out of this lie because uh, you can still get contact. It's not super – you're not looking at super, super thick grass. But if you're short-sided, this is a I have to go up because I'm not going to spin it. And that's where – the player that's going to expect the same spin and trajectory out of the AI, um, they're going to do two things. They're going to not hit it hard enough because it's not direct contact and they're not going to have spin. So they're going to get a ball that releases. They might not even get it to the green. So th- those are the pieces we've really got to look at when we start introducing mm-hmm. crap. Speeds change and spin changes there. So the, so a, a little more framework here is needed, right? Like where the, the first one, you might see that little wider approach going back with, like we talked about with day, you know, where it's yeah. a little more passive here. Would you, would you start recommending, okay, let's, let's start getting that club head to climb a little bit more. We, we, we definitely need to get a little bit more radial club head working up. Uh, we certainly want to keep the, the sternum, you know, on top here as well. And, and not letting that drift to the right. Do you, yeah. do you like weight forward and do you like, let's get some more uh, wrist caught going back earlier on this particular lie? What I, what I'd say is, and this is, this is where you have to decide what shot we're hitting first. So yeah. if I'm going to play this as a runner, I'm intentionally going to, this can be a little lower and it's not going to have spin. I want this to run out. When we start talking about not being able to predict contact, I can guarantee a few things. So if I am still that wide and a touch shallow, I'm going to guarantee I don't get groove on ball, which in the B lie, it might be, I might be able to, I might not be able to, if I just play my normal shot, I want to guarantee that I don't, if I'm trying to run this. So that'd be where I kind of, I would stay maybe a little wider. I would intentionally have that a little shallower to make sure that it's going through the grass. Cause again, in the B lie, we're saying it's not super, super heavy. Yeah. We can't guarantee that contact. So if I'm running it, or even if I'm kind of bumping it into the hill with lower loft, I want to guarantee I don't get groove on ball. Whereas if I'm playing the higher shot, you know, I need to get loft in there. I do want to keep some angle of attack. I want to keep that loft and angle attack separated. I'd absolutely start introducing some, what we call kind of steepeners, yep. a little bit of that wrist hinge, maybe even a little bit more tilt forward to make sure that club's coming down and, and going to get through that grass. So this is where, as soon as we start changing variables, I change a little bit of technique for, for specific shots to guarantee things given that lie. On the, on the low one, would you move the ball back a little? I probably would. Yeah. yeah but just, again, if, if my intent is low, I don't get crazy with changes there. I'd yeah. rather change that trajectory through the, the loft choice than, than shifting that ball a ton, of, especially for the amateur golfer. Like, if we can make it simple for them and yeah. go, All right, if I need to hit it lower, I want to keep this guy pretty regular, yeah. the lower the angle attack, and I just want to play the game with changing the, the loft, the top vector. Right. Yeah. Then if the mechanics could stay – pretty uniform through the whole thing uh even high level players like if we don't have to make it complicated then we, we certainly shouldn't mm-hmm. talk about club face because you know speaking of of joe who you mentioned like the club face you know, and how it kind of rotates back you, you see most players you know where the toe is a little bit more up but a, but a player you work with in brooks i mean it, you'll see the toe a little bit more down you know sometimes on these particular shots you see um, Victor kind of abandoned maybe the face a little bit, rotating back, and it's okay to, you know, see the left the, the club face down. Is there obviously you can work around a lot of different things, but oh, yeah. to a, to a 
mid handicap listening, would you prefer, let's just say where we're trying to pop it up a little bit, you know, a little more medium trajectory. Sure. Would you prefer to see the face rotate, say a little bit more toe up? I would, I would, my preference is that we're going to take care of that at setup. At so setup. You would, you would sort of see that in, if you're looking at video in there, at the, you know, whatever we call it, P2, whatever, you know, yep. or it's parallel, you would certainly see the face uh, or kind of that leading edge not match the spine, but it would be a little bit open. Yep. I would say let's take care of that at a dress, get the loft open and the grip down a little bit. That helps us pop it up. Um, but then the same movement, so they don't have to change or, or intentionally rotate open. Or anything. Yep. Then once the club's at a dress that way, it's just, again, we're in the same movement. Yeah. So I, I like the guys to sort of take care of that uh, prior to having to manipulate. And again, for a standard shot, we're just going a little bit higher. Um, take care of that three or four extra degrees of loft at address and then move the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is, this is one of the most important shots for a player right here. Like the ball's in the rough a little bit. It's not crazy down. Like not, not every, you know, not, not every golf course is going to have super thick rough. So, right. but they're going to have a little rough. And, mm -hmm. and so like to me, a and B, like you've got to, you've got to be able to have some technique that's going to manage A and B at the bare minimum. Right. And probably, 100%. 100%. yeah, probably be more than a, like, you know, I mean, I, I find that if you can show someone this type of shot, like that, that, that goes a long ways in their confidence and their ability to hit maybe some of the other shots and kind of build off of the technique of this one. Um, yeah. You know, when I was first getting, before we go to the sea life, which is a, is a fun one. We've got some cool video of Brooks here too, who you work with Brooks Kepka. When I was first getting into teaching, um, one of the styles on this particular shot, and I want to get your reaction to this, was called a hinge and hold. Oh yeah, the Mick yeah the old Mickelson videos. Yeah, we've all yeah right right. So so real quick setting the stage. Okay, so hinge and hold was like okay, I take it back, get a little wrist hinge, a little radial there, club head above, yeah. and and then from there I would turn my chest, and it feels like I'm just kind of holding my wrist. And, yeah. you know, nothing really changes. Let's say the shaft and the lead arm, you know, stay relatively in line over yeah. here. And you would see Phil. I mean, Phil, you know, he hits a lot of shots to kind of both arms straight. Yeah. Yeah. He's not a 64 degree wedge, 62 degree wedge part of the time. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> there's a little, Is, he, he can hold that shaft lane and still have a whole bunch of loss. So his top vector gets to stay way up there. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and you'll see most of your players have shaft lane through a lot of those shots. Um, yep. It's it's not something that kind of that directly I, I would I would teach. There's there's got to be uh, for the for the B life. I'm popping it up. Uh, I need some delivery of that shaft. I've got to I've got to let that thing yeah uh, release out because most players should not have a wedge that's got that much loft to it. Um, hinge and hold for a lot of people. I, I think where the amateur golfer hears that and then doesn't get the complete version where they struggle. Is if they're trying to hit a slightly higher shot, uh, there's two things that don't make a lot of sense for them. They're hinge and then holding it. My loft is down. The other one, so if they're not gonna, if they're not gonna let that shaft start to release out, they're gonna get high by trying to lean back and shallow that out to hit it up. So now we got duffs and thins. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, again, yeah. then like we were talking about earlier, now we're in trail side bend trying to help that ball up. The low point of our arc is too far back. We certainly can't control contact that way. So a hinge and hold would work when we're talking about sort of wrists and arm movement, as long as that torso is turning and going forward and then staying forward, we'd hit a low shot. Yeah. Um, and and it, it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a bad option for the one we're kind of trying to run mm -hmm. out of that lie. Cause we're going to get our angle of attack and we're going to keep the loft down. Uh, I think people get that one confused. If they're trying to go up with it, it's probably yeah. not. That yeah. Fair to say the first lie, good, the, the good lie, um, you need a little shaft lean, out of shaft lean. You could, you know, you could obviously some variables there, but the second one, we definitely need a little more shaft lean. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're trying to control contact for sure. Yeah. yeah. All right, here we go. Third one. This is one that, uh, you know, we can, we can be a little scared of here. Yeah. A now our, lie. Our yeah. Set, in a bad spot. <laughs> set that one up. <laughs> <laughs> so this, uh, you, made, you made a good statement. This is not necessarily going to be on every golf course. I'm going to need some taller rough, right? Yeah. This has got to be some thicker grass. So we're going to see this like in your, your blue grass, uh, 
you know, down in Bermuda, you can get these lies. It's going to look a little different, but sort of the difference between a B lie and a C lie, just to describe it to the people listening, a B lie is obviously in the rough and I can't guarantee um, ball on groove contact, but there's some space between the ball and, the, and kind of the bottom of the ground. The C lie, that ball's sitting down. So regardless of the height, like Bermuda might only be, you know, nowhere near the, the length of a bluegrass. But that ball sitting on the ground and I can't get a uh, groove on ball would, would qualify the same way. So that's sort of the difference between the B and C. It can be super thick grass. It can be thin grass. So you got a couple of variables there. But the rules for sea lie are uh, it's on the ground, which makes it a little bit more of a um, tricky shot. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, here, there's no chance we get groove on ball contact. So we can kind of throw that out. At no point can I hit a, a little spinning chip out of this out of this lie because I just I'm not going to get groove on on ball here and control my friction. So that being said, I I must play by the rules of no spin. I've got to use trajectory here. So uh, and I think in a second you've got some video and some frame by frame of of this shot. But this is sort of we call it. and I stole this from Pete Cowan uh, just on the name uh, the cut and hold, not cut in the sense that we're slicing it. Uh, cut in the sense that we are we're starting with a ton of loft and we are cutting the grass and, and the turf out from underneath the ball and then in the follow through we are abruptly stopping the grip so the club head kind of, we're hitting the brakes on the grip so the club head flies by there a little bit more presents all the loft so that we never kind of decel the club head we're aggressively deceling the grip so the club head will accelerate um, but we're gonna that grip is gonna stop kind of by the front hip Yep. That throws the like, cuts the grass, cuts the turf, and we hold that face open. We do our best to not let that grass and turf kind of catch the heel and roll it. So we're cutting the grass and holding the loft. That's sort of where we get the 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 term cut and hold. And you have to be aggressive in this shot. The mm-hmm. moment the moment you get a little tentative and slow down, you, you'll you'll duff it or or blade it out. This is uh you know you have to commit to the shot and then hit it. But yeah, you've got a perfect frame by frame up there, and you'll see on that last frame. So uh kind of asking like you have in terms of wrist movement now we're in a little bit of a specialty shot we need steepeners and we need speed yep so we're absolutely going to use angular change in wrist we're going to get into radial we're going to have some inch so that we can throw we can unload that that's a speed and a steepener because we've got to have speed to get through this thick grass even think about your bermudas down here in florida it mm-hmm. might not be two inches tall but that stuff can be gnarly and if that ball oh down, yeah yeah, yeah. You better speed and shove it in there and then in that final, so that's kind of the second frame. You see he's at lead arms parallel to the ground. And I know it's cut out of the picture there, but he's at 90 degrees of kind of shaft to arm there. He's got this thing hinged. And then the final frame, is that's his follow through. That's as far as that follow through went. So the yeah. grip and that that's on, yep. on his lead hip and that shaft hasn't gotten past 45 degrees. It's it's cut the grass, hold the loft up. It's funny. When I think of this shot, I think of Brooks. You he's know, like. He's yeah. phenomenal at this shot. Yeah, he really is. Like I, when I think of this shot as a um, like poster child, I think of Brooks. Like, think about the places he's obviously been successful. The places, you know, your major championships, and even the golf courses that have just crazy thick stuff. Yeah, is and this is sort of Pete. And I've stolen so much from Pete Cowan. Pete Cowan has been a, a unbelievable mentor to me. He's been generous. Uh, with everything he's got and he's obviously a huge part in Brooks's short game success and I've yeah. um Pete's in Europe and he's not out all the time so he's you know kind of given me a huge mentorship in the playbook to sort of oversee this while he's not around and we 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 collaborate um very very well and we see Brooks you know in the hard stuff here Pete's been a huge help the difficult shots uh, simply because he knows the playbook he knows that you've got to hit these shots differently. And then he's a phenomenal athlete. You know, he's, yeah. he's a class talent. But it's literally if – I know Coach Saban just retired. You know, the best coach in, you know, maybe the history of college football. He's got an unreal playbook. You could go take a less talented team and let him run his playbook and strategy, and they're going to beat more talented teams <laughs> just because yeah. it's the strategy. He yeah. knows what he can and can't do. So right. a correct playbook and then um, having the stones in the, in the – in the, in the high pressure situations to hit hard shots. Yeah. Uh, that guy's been very, very good at. So the places that have crazy thick grass and he knows how to play the shot, he gets up and down from some gnarly places. Yeah, he does. Underrated short game. A couple things here as I, as we look at the sequence here, 
Um, you know, one is he's got a big stance. Two is he's got the ball forward. And three is not a lot of shaft lean at address, although he obviously creates it at impact, as you can see there in the third sequence. Yep. But it would be, you know, for a lot of the audience, um, including myself at times here, I would look at that lie and you could easily like, you know what, I'm going to play the ball back and just try to pop it out of there. Like you're not necessarily playing the correct shot, but you're just trying to like get it out of there. But like you said, you got to create speed. So you need loft yep. and you need some of the, the radial there. Yeah. So is, is it, is it okay here to maybe create a little more radial at address? It's like Brooks is kind of getting down in there a little bit more. He's increasing yeah, so, that angle. Yeah. So as we add, uh, as we're going to open the face to have more loft, if we don't change the shaft angle, if we just, then that, that loft is up and for right hand golf, we're pointing to the right. So we'll lower the grip. So if we had a down the line video, uh, or, or pictures the shaft angle would be low oh perfect we do yeah. so uh that for that, that grip is down yeah yeah that's not a normal line angle so as he opens the face that grip lays down which absolutely when you think about that as that grip goes down i'm already going to have some of that radial built in yep so uh, yeah you're, you got it right there um and it makes that face kind of look more left the loft look it, more, more yeah it does but the in the in 3d that loft is higher and point at the target if you put a t on that face or like a face angle magnet like it's maybe 70 degrees aloft, but it's pointed at the target. Mm -hmm. So for the amateur golfer or, or the golfer that doesn't quite understand that, as I'm opening the face to add loft, it's pointed up and to the right. The leading edge might be pointed massively to the right, but if I lower the grip in 3D, that loft starts pointing back to the target. And that's sort of one of the secrets to having control over those shots is that my true 3D face angle is still in line with my target. So I'm not right. having to slice across it or, or hook it out to try to match those things up. Your amateur golfer, a lot of the time, what I see is they open loft and then try to slice across it. They get one or two shots. It whiffs short right because it's so yep. far separated in 3D or it gets closed up and they hit the fastball left. <laughs> yeah. they, they kind of they get the two yeah. shots. Yeah. So if, I, if I can get that face in 3D pointed at my target, and I then I can keep my path kind of neutral and the I'm in control of the direction all the time. And that's one of the things that we do with a lot of our players. But you can see now in that third in that third picture there how much hinge he's got. So you would see that lead oh, yeah. grip past the neutral we were talking about in terms of uh, hinging You're, that way. So like at a dress, you know, everybody's going to be a little bit down. Our normal pitch shots, we might get to neutral to where that wrist and the forearm get back in line. Mm -hmm. But as we can see in that third picture, he's definitely in radial to where that forearm and then the wrist has got hinge. That's a speed piece. We have to have speed. It's a steepener that helps us cut through yeah. thick grass. Yeah. And then as you can see, it's a perfect picture uh, on the far right there, the fourth frame, how, how aggressively that loft is kept. Yeah. There. There's no, like, Love that. Yeah. And that thing, you can see where the ball is in that frame. I mean, it's the club's moving faster than the ball. Smash factor on this is going to be like 0. 0.6, 0. 0.7. Like yep. it's a change up. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I think the one thing we can say for sure over the last couple of years I've talked to Parker McLaughlin about this um, Love and some Parker. others. Yeah, and I've talked to a couple others. Like, it's fair to say in the last couple of years, you see more players squared up at a dress hitting these shots yeah. than maybe in years past. Like, they would, like, to your point, they'd be more open. Again, you go back into when you get into the industry, face open, stance open, swing along your stance line. You look yeah. at Brooks, his feet look closed. His feet look like they're aiming right and his shoulders are square. So when we're responsible with the geometry of the swing, there's nothing that makes sense about slicing across. This right. Thing. Yeah. Right. So if we can be responsible with angle of attack uh, and loft, and I want to keep the vector stacked up. So when I say uh, 3d face and 3d path, if they start separating, yeah, uh, that's not, so we talked about spin loft. Well in 3d, I've increased spin loft. I can slip that golf ball off. Like we talked about short, right. Or if, the face catches up to both mm -hmm. of them. They're over there to the left. It's like, I want them stacked up. Yeah. So if I'm doing that, I, I need that path still working pretty neutral. Now yeah. for him and players, I've had a couple players that are high ball speed, like a lot of shaft lean guys. Um, I'll hook them a little bit so they can't keep it leaned and drag it around the corner. And then they, they have no option to get the loft in there. So I'll hook them. So they have to start letting that mm -hmm. shaft a little bit. And as that arc, the more forward that ball is, 
that arc's moving more and more left. And we think about just sort of the basic geometry. Yep. Of more forward in the arc, the more left it is. Well, as you notice in face on, that ball's in sort of bunker shot position. Yeah. It's already going to be going left. I need it yep. to aim right so that 3D path is actually at the target. And yep. you see, well, I actually started looking back. There's there's some old, old videos of like Seve and Sneed and a couple of guys that even did way back in the day some like videos on their short game, Seve specifically. And he even kind of towed the line when he was speaking about, oh, yeah, open face stance, cut across it. You'll have a hard time finding me. There's only a few highlights, obviously, from that era. You have a hard time finding me a highlight of him in a bunker where he's not hooked with his stance. Yep. Hit bunker shots that way. <laughs> So it's like, it's one of those things. It was the yep. info. You wanted to be in golf digest and you wrote an article that said, yeah, I'm going to hook my players in high soft shots. The editor's just going like, yeah, that we're, we're not printing that. No, yeah. we're not. That. Yeah. Just sort of the, the status quo of the industry for a while. But yeah. when you take a step back and look at the geometry of what's going on, it makes no sense to be super, super open. Like there's some shots. Certainly we will be a little bit open, but not kind of what has been prescribed for, for 60 years. Love it. Cool shot. Really is. And Brooks is the poster child. Of, Brooks doesn't get enough credit for a short game. I mean, because he's, you know, he he's, so, look, the guy just hits it so good. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's easy to just go. Yeah, he's a great ball. So he is. But you don't get the world number one and win. A bunch no, of majors. you don't win that many majors without <laughs> a world class short game. Yeah. And one uh, thing I do want to point out here, because it's sort of relevant, you know, as we looked at bunker and we look at bunker too. Look at the forward movement from end of, like, if you look at the second frame there on the face on, he's still kind of stacked up in neutral. Mm -hmm. But then you go into frame three and frame four, how much forward he's moved in that downstroke. Mm -hmm. And we really see that in the legs. Of like, those those legs have driven forward. He shifted his entire package forward uh, to control where that low point is, especially in that thick stuff. Cool stuff. All right, we've got one more here. So let's go to the D lie, the fourth one. So set the stage on this. Yeah, this is the one that this is the one that sort of scares a lot of people. Uh, and it's in this one you certainly can't find in every grass. This is going to be taller, rough. Uh, so again, you're kind of in fescues, you're in blue grasses, and it's the one where long grass is kind of laid down uh, into you. So into the green, grass is laid down, and the ball's just sitting on top. Mm -hmm. So when every gol every golfer walks up to that, and it's like, oh my god, what am I going to do here? Like, and if they don't know how to play this shot they're either going to hit it two inches in front of them or they're going to skull it over the green. It's like the two options they've got. <laughs> when, you, when you know how to play the shot, yeah. um, actually one of the easier of the four lies to, to predict, at least. Um, we play this shot a lot like a bunker shot. There was, at the, at the presentation I did that you were at at, uh, at Andrew Rice's coaches camp a handful of years ago, I had a video of George Gankis. We were in uh, Tampa at uh, Valspar and we were w both waiting on players and he was asking about that shot. And I, I put him in it and it's basically, it, it's a unique shot, sort of a specialty shot. Mm -hmm. You're going to set up to that guy, similar to what you saw on the sea lot. The ball's going to be kind of forward. It's going to be very bunker shot set up. Yeah. Um, all the loft. So you're going to set up with that. Like you're going to feel like you got 80 or 90 degrees of loft on your lob wedge. Now we talked about being able to predict and guarantee contact. This shot is very shallow, and I am intentionally in that long into grass way earlier than my ball. I'm talking earlier than a bunker shot. I need to guarantee I do not put a groove on this ball because I'm playing a lot of loft and a lot of speed, right? So all the loft, this is coming in shallow. And if we think for the, for the viewers out there, like this is my grass and the ball's sitting uh, up on top of it. That's sort of mm -hmm. what we're talking about. There's my grass ball sitting on top of it i'm playing the shot this way so i'm into yep. the ground i want the club if this is my grass and this is my club i want the club coming in with the loft and the visualization is i'm going to start put that grass is going to start pushing up and i'm hitting sort of a draw again not in the sense that i'm shooting the path out to the right and rolling the face over but the sense that i'm going to let the toe or when i've got all the loft open the toes behind the heel i'm going to let that toe start catching up and the face is going to get taller and, and I'm using that grass to sort of push that ball out. So it's like a ton of loft and bingo. So that, exactly. So the viewers there kind of saw what, uh, what you did. It's like, and if you're doing that off of fairway lie, you, you've you 100% percent duffed it. Like you're going to hit yeah. way behind. That's the point. That's the point of that shot. Yeah. I'm intentionally in that grass. So what do I lose when I don't get friction? I gain trajectory. 
So yep. this is a shot we exclusively play high. We exclusively play maximum loft, so you can give that enough speed to guarantee that that tangly into grainy grass doesn't get a set. So high I would hook. set yeah, up – High hook for the guys listening. High, high hook. hook. Yeah. But I would set up similar to Brooks did in three. Yeah. Maybe Absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah. then so – Allow when that ball's forward, if we aim left, we're hitting it left. We need to aim a neutral to slightly to the right. Yep. And where you saw Brooks's face looking kind of up to the sky at three, yeah, you know, like this. Now we're going to probably see that toe cross gonna, a little bit more. Absolutely, because we're intentionally trying to get that face to stand up, catch the turn the corner. Yeah, yeah, and you might see a big long follow through here. This will be kind of a big, like long, soft. But yeah, that's the shot right there. Yeah, it does feel like a draw, which is, yeah. which is so unique to those who have been used to face open, stance open, and then they're just dragging that handle left. And, yeah. you know, and they're getting a where, lot of that wipe. Yeah, if you're trying to hit that ball, when you're that far left, you're going to have a ton of angle of attack to try to get those things back, the 3D mm -hmm. back to neutral. Now, all of a sudden, I might catch that bottom groove. That's where, you're, that's where your hammer golfer just smokes it over the green. Feels like your lead wrist feels like it's like, like this effect. Down, rotate, yeah. Yeah. The pump stays down the whole time. Of the yeah, game. yeah. I think I heard you say that, or someone – Talk about that lead wrist kind of working that way. I I, I really love that sensation. Yeah. Play a karate um, chop. Yeah. 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 And that shot, once you once you kind of play around with that, you realize that you're limited. That's the shot you have. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Um, but it's unbelievably predictable. And mm -hmm. then you just kind of – the gauge is how thick and how dense is that grass. That's the practice week to week or, or wherever you're at of how hard do I hit it. But mm -hmm. if you just think bunker shot speeds – and you're a ton of loft and high hooks out of there, you'll pop that thing up. And I, I think the, I think it's a YouTube video. I, it may still be out there that I had, uh, or no, I think it was George Gankus's Instagram at the time where he, he, I had him film or I filmed that for him and sent it to him. And he literally puts it on that line, just pops this thing out. He goes, he almost hoops it. And he's just like, one, one take George or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> but, but it's that simple. Once you understand how to play that shot, it's a pretty predictable shot. Yeah. All right. Let's finish with this. Got a little, uh, got a little Brooks uh, in the bunker here. Greenside bunker looks similar to three really. Um, as far as the, the setup there, feet wide, ball forward, shafts, pretty neutral weights yep. left. Um, the finish, the finish is, is, has climbed into a bigger, yep. uh, bigger finish, but a lot of similarities there to what we were looking at in, uh, you know, lie number three. I would, I would say if we combined a little bit of three and four, we're kind of in bunker shot. Okay. That, because the, the, the sand is a little bit easier to navigate than maybe that um, sea lie. It's going to go through a little bit easier than having to cut it out of that really dense ball on bottom because you kind of technically have some space from the ball and where the, the bottom of the club is going to go. So it's, it's kind of, if we want to call it, it's kind of sitting up because we're going to go mm -hmm. under that in the sand. Uh, so it's kind of like a, the lie four or the D lie. So the basics here, again, to point this out, if we look at setup to impact, how much more forward chest and pelvis have gone. Mm -hmm. And we're working on this here, like because the amateur golfer struggles out of the bunker for two reasons that, you know, you, you, you'll get, or so you get two shades. They get the bladed out or they get the duffel. Usually comes from the similar problems we were talking about at the very beginning. They equate hitting a high shot, if we think angle of attack and loft, they equate hitting a high shot to, I need to help that up, and they give up all their angle of attack. Again, mm -hmm. circling back to Joe and talking about how steep you can be and still be successful. Yep. What we can't do is be, you know, two or three down and like super, super shallow. I'm not saying we can't hit shots there, but, man, we are living on the nice edge. We, we're The moment we're early, we're super early, and the moment we're late, we've blighted it. So – we, move, we make sure our players are moving forward enough to get those centers forward to make sure we keep angle of attack down. So if I want to hit the ball higher, I need I need loft. So you can see the dress there. Yep. 75, 80 degrees of loft. That thing's laid open, grips down a little bit, similar to what we saw in, in C and D lie. But the forward movement there for bunker shots, uh, if an amateur golfer is struggling, what I'd tell them to do, the first thing i tell them to do, if they're not standing in front of me where I can watch the other variables is play all the loft and try to shove that club under the ball and leave it in the sand. 
And if you're blading them and sculling them out and you do that, I guarantee you start popping those things up soft. Then you kind of back it off and how do I get into a follow through? But if they'll start getting that, the arc deeper in the mm-hmm. sand, um, the amateur golfer will generally have a little more success. They're afraid of the sand. Yeah. A lot of times. Yeah. So if I'm trying to help that up. Two things happen. But if I lean back to help hit that shot up, I'm bringing in early sand or no sand, and I'm generally going to have to be de-lofted to stretch out to the ball as I move away yep. from it. So I've got two problems. I, I've got I, – I don't have any separation of face and pass, so I'm not going to get any spin. And if I do get good contact, it's a fastball. Yeah. So it's I need the steepness. So an amateur golfer struggling, shove it in the sand for a little while yep. and see that thing pop up a little. One thing I, I think that's always kind of a learning curve for – and I totally agree with that. I would say that's one of the areas that I've changed over the years. I think early on, I would be like, okay, long, you know, long swing, enough swing, swing them to the finish, that whole thing. But I think now I agree. I, I think I've transitioned more into, okay, yeah, let's get some swing. Let's get some hinge, but we got to get down and then just yeah. kind of feel like you just kind of leave it down and turn through and yeah, love and that. I, oh yeah. 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 I totally, I'm totally on the same page with that. Hard. It's hard for that amateur golfer. If, you, if they start eating speed and you tell them, all right, we're going to leave this down. We're going to put yep. it somewhere down. As they start adding speed, it doesn't stay down. Right. When they start giving it full speed, it, it, the, it, yeah. the force pulls it into fall. And all of a sudden mm-hmm. you take a video and it looks like a normal bunker shot. But the amateur golfer doesn't have enough speed uh, because it, the few they've hit good go way too far. Mm-hmm. So they slow down. Now we're doubling down on Now yeah. I'm slow and spin loss closed like they just work themselves down the spiral of the, the things that make sense in their mind yep. logically are the worst things they could possibly do. The other thing I was going to mention here, and I'll finish with this, is like when you look at Brooks and you look at the how, you know, it's a three quarter backswing, his left yeah. shoulder still, his left shoulder still kind of right there on top of the ball. Like, you know, these guys, when you look at the full swing, you know, there's this, you know, there's the turn, the left shoulder's working back down behind the ball, there, there's some hip turn for some. But there's this loading sensation, right? And obviously the club's going to get three quarter or complete. If you look at Brooks, like he's taking a three quarter swing, but it, it, it's a little more independent per se, arms and wrists, right? Maybe a little more independent from the torso, which which I think oftentimes working with an amateur, you, you know, you'll see, you know, maybe some of the bigger and like learning, okay, let's let's be left, let's calm down, let's let's kind of work the arms and the wrist, maybe a little more independent, keep the keep the sternum forward, and then leave it in the sand coming through, rather than you know doing too much with the with the torso and the hips, and now they're moving off and those kinds of things. I think kind of showing them that in short game, like your arms and hands, perhaps maybe a little more independency in the backswing can help that point of entry coming down. Especially as we're getting shots that have to have speed so when we're in short game shots where we want the ball to be the ball speed to be slow but we need it to go up yeah club head speed's got to be high now if we get into full swing where we're kind of like are right, we drift away from it and those full swing pieces come in i can't slow the ball down when i hit i'm just things are going to end up speeding it up so we need speed but we also need inefficiency of energy transfer so that forward nature if he's turning and staying forward, I can't load and, and the body continue to go in those big full swing. I don't have all that range of movement. We don't want it. Mm-hmm. I want you forward and I need speed. So we get those steepeners and speed through some angular change in the wrists and the, and the arms so that that speed can be produced much more down than it would be if I'm trying to speed a seven iron up. It's like I need it a little shallower. I need it de-lofted. I'm intentionally getting the exact opposite of what good ball hitters do. It's like I yep. need inefficient energy transfer. Inefficient, yeah. So if I wanted, if I wanted a guy to hit a seven iron as inefficient as possible, he'd look like that at the top of the. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and that's oftentimes what they look like, right? I mean, they don't. It's. I, I yeah. was literally joking with him and, and yeah. another player the other day. It's like if you, because we're cleaning up some off season stuff and yeah. same thing. Like he was bringing full swing mechanics into chipping. You were yep. seeing two or three inches of drift away from golf ball. He was too shallow, scraping into it. It's like, all right, videoed it, pull track man out. It's like, we're in pitch shots at three degrees down. Like, can't do that. Show him the video. He's drifting back. He's like, oh, man. I said, think about it this way. The really good golfer wants to chip it and pitch it like the 30 handicapper drives it. Steep and a lot of loft. Mm-hmm. They hit inefficient ball speed spinny shots. Yeah. Like, And then you want to drive it like they chip it. 
leaning back and deal lofting it hitting too shallow on it is what they do with chip shots that's what mm-hmm. i want with driver i want high ball speeds and low spin it's like yep. the amateur golfer just gets them backwards yep it's good stuff man i could ask a thousand more questions but i i think like those four shots and the way you articulated it i have no doubt like people are going to walk away from here wanting to go outside and try it like here, let's smooth some snow out. Let's try it on some <laughs> wet grass. <laughs> there's no, there's no heavy rough right now in most of the, uh, in most of the United States. But like, you know, reading the lie and then talking about some of the technique that we did, um, man, you're you're arming people with things that are going to improve their short game. And, and we know, look, we can't do things so much like Brooks in the full swing. I mean, I know I can't. I can't hit it out there 325 off the tee. Um, you know, we can't get open like like we see with John Rahm and others. But what, what we can do is we can read the lie and we can, we can understand technique and, and learn how to hit these types of shots, like you said, controlling spin loft. Um, and, and by golly, you start pissing people off you're playing with because you start getting up and down from everywhere. You know, it's, 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 it's like you're not going to hit every, every pitch shot to two feet. But what you can do is, especially for the amateur golfer, avoid what I call the, the two chips. Like if we're inside 30 yards, it needs to be on the green. So yeah. if I'm trying to hit a shot from a lie that's not possible, I've got to accidentally get it on the green. Like mm-hmm. at least choosing shots that are possible, if you think about it in terms of trajectory and friction, what's possible given my lie? If we just do that, we don't go in and hit a shot that, that's, that was never in the cards. And then as we explore and practice a little bit, get a little touch for some of those shots, yeah, I might, I might not hit everything to two feet, but I'm going to have an opportunity for par. I'm gonna have yeah. a reasonable bar putt from some from some bad places. Yeah. All right. Well, let's let's uh, this summer we'll bring it back and we'll we'll go deep dive on putting. Fair enough. Love it. Love it. All Love right, it. man. Hey, Jeffrey Pierce. I know you don't do a lot of these. I appreciate your time. You're a busy man, and uh, go follow him, man. He doesn't do a lot of these. He doesn't like it, but he's one of the best out there. So this is great information. Can't thank you enough. Travis, my pleasure. Anytime.